Mr. Beat presents Supreme Court Briefs. Panama City, Florida. June 3rd, 1961. Sometime between midnight and 8 a.m., someone breaks into the Bay Harbor pool room and steals money from a cash register. One witness reported that they had seen a man named Clarence Earl Gideon walk out of the pool room at around 5.30 that morning with a wine bottle and his pockets filled with wads of cash. Gideon, a drifter who spent most of his adult life in and out of different prisons for nonviolent crimes, was an easy target. Police arrested him for breaking and entering and trying to steal. Well, as it turns out, Gideon had no money. Because he couldn't afford a lawyer, he asked a Florida Circuit Court judge to appoint him one, claiming the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution guarantees everyone a lawyer. The judge was like, sorry, dude, and denied his request. Florida law only allowed the court to provide a lawyer if the defendant was charged with a capital offense, or one so serious that death might be the punishment. And so, Gideon was left to represent him Himself, and most say he didn't do that good of a job defending himself. The court found him guilty of the accused crimes and sentenced him to five years in prison. While serving his sentence in a Florida state prison, Gideon began to teach himself law, which made him even more confident that his rights were being violated when the Florida Circuit Court refused to provide a lawyer for him. From his prison cell, he hand wrote a letter directly to the Supreme Court. Not only did the Supreme Court actually read his petition, they agreed to actually hear his case. Gideon's lawsuit specifically went against the secretary of the Florida Department of Corrections, who was a dude named H.G. Cochran. However, Cochran went up and done retired and was replaced by another dude named Louis Wainwright. So Gideon was suing Wainwright. Get it? Gideon v. Wainwright? Anyway, the Supreme Court was being all nice and assigned Gideon a well-established Washington, D.C. lawyer and future Supreme Court justice named Abe Fortas to represent him. As it turns out, the Supreme Court had been waiting for this opportunity. Back in 1932 in Powell v. Alabama, the court had decided that people accused of crimes should both be notified that they have a right to a lawyer and should be provided one if they can't afford one. However, this only applied to capital offenses. And then, 10 years later, the court decided in Betts v. Brady that unless there were special circumstances, people didn't have to have a lawyer provided for them by the state. Well, with Gideon, the court said, the heck with you, Betts. No, not Mr. Betts. Betts v. Brady. They overturned Betts v. Brady. On March 18th, 1963, the court announced unanimously in favor of Gideon. It argued that the Sixth Amendment doesn't point out a difference between capital and non-capital cases. It also said the 14th Amendment gave the federal government authority to control state laws that denied Sixth Amendment rights. The decision did not free Gideon from prison. Rather, he got a new trial with a new lawyer provided by the government of Florida. The new trial took place August 5th, 1963, five months after the Supreme Court decision. His new lawyer completely discredited the original case against Gideon. The jury found Gideon not guilty after just one hour of deliberation. Gideon was free. Gideon v. Wainwright further protected the rights of the accused, which the Warren Court would also do again three years later with the Miranda v. Arizona decision. Hey, check out that episode if you haven't already. The the decision also greatly expanded the power of the 14th Amendment, protecting individual rights against both federal and state laws that threatened them. The decision created the huge increase in the need for public defenders, and today Americans take it for granted that a lawyer will be provided for them if they can't afford one. However, sadly, today many states do not provide adequate funding for their public defender systems. As a matter of fact, the state of Missouri, or Missouri, was recently sued due to this. Speaking of Missouri, that's where Gideon was buried after he died in 1972 after living the rest of his life in relative obscurity. Gideon's grave was unmarked and largely forgotten until 1984 when the American Civil Liberties Union placed a granite headstone on his grave. On the stone is a quote from a letter Gideon had written to Abe Fortas before the Supreme Court saw his case. It says, quote, I believe that each era finds an improvement in law for the benefit of mankind. I'll see you for the next Supreme Court case, jury. It's been a really, 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 really long time coming, but I'm about to reach that milestone of 10,000 
subscribers. Fingers crossed. Hopefully I get there. And I figured this would be a great opportunity to uh, do one of those good old fashioned Q&A videos that all the kids are doing these days. They're all the rave. So yeah, if you have a question for me about anything, comment below and I will answer it for that 10,000 subscriber video. And that video you just watched here, Gideon V. Wainwright, that was brought to you by Matthew Abbott, a donor on Patreon, and he got dibs on uh, what I should make a video about because of his support on Patreon. So you can too. Yeah.